The Uyghurs are a Turkic, mostly Muslim people living in a province of northwestern China called Xinjiang. Their population in Xinjiang numbers out about 11 million, while another million or so are scattered around the globe, mostly in Turkic countries in Central Asia like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Indeed, while most Uyghurs live in China today, they share much more in common both culturally and historically with those Central Asian countries than with China proper. Today, we'll explore the complex history of the Uyghur people and follow their centuries-long journey from the steppes of Mongolia to the oases of Xinjiang. The modern-day Uyghurs are the result of a mixing of various peoples and cultures over the centuries, so we cannot pinpoint a single starting point for their history, but for the sake of time, we will oversimplify this matter for now and consider 7th century Mongolia as the stage for the first chapter in our story. Mongolia prior to the 13th century was home to a variety of Mongolic and Turkic peoples. These peoples would take turns ruling vast, diverse nomadic empires. In the 7th century, the dominant force in Mongolia was the Gwekturks, who ruled the Turkic cognate. One of the many Turkic peoples that the Gwekturks ruled over was the Uyghurs. These ancient Uyghurs were not Muslims like their descendants, but Buddhist and Tengri. Their language, Old Uyghur, was part of the Siberian branch of the Turkic languages family. Now, these Uyghurs were part of a confederation of Turkic tribes known as the Tiela. The Tiela were not very loyal to the Greek Turks. In fact, in the early 7th century, they often allied with the Tang Dynasty of China to fight the Turkic cognate. In the year 630, the Tang Dynasty conquered Mongolia with the Uyghurs' help, but the Greek Turks restored their empire in 682. In the mid-8th century, the Uyghurs and their allies, the Karluks and the Basmils, rebelled against the Gwek Turks. In 744, the Alliance captured the Gwek Turk capital and beheaded their leader. The Alliance then fell apart, and the Uyghurs emerged victorious to become the next masters of Mongolia. They established the Uyghur Khaganate, with Kutluk Bilge as their first Khagan. Three years later, his son Bayanshir ascended the throne and opened up a golden age for the empire. Bayanchur ruled from the planned city of Ordubalik, abandoning the old capital of the Gwek Turks. For the first few years of his rule, he solidified the Uyghurs' control over Mongolia by subduing opposing tribes. He also kept up an alliance of sorts with the Tang Dynasty, especially during the devastating Anlushan Rebellion of 755, which lasted until 763. The Uyghurs were paid handsomely for their help, something they would use to their advantage moving forward. Following the Anlushan Rebellion, the Tang Dynasty was significantly weakened and began to suffer from frequent revolts. The Uyghurs would show up unsolicited, put down the rebels, and force the Chinese to pay them for their assistance. The Uyghurs were allies with another important group, the Sogdians. The Sogdians were an Iranian people who lived in the Terem Basin and controlled a major part of the Silk Road. The Uyghurs received silk from China and sold it to the Sogdians, who would then send it westward. The old Uyghur alphabet was adapted from the Sogdian alphabet, and in the mid-8th century, the Uyghurs converted to Manichaeism, the religion of the Sogdians. Manichaeism was a major, now extinct religion founded in Persia. It described the universe as a constant struggle between good and evil, fought between a good but not omnipotent god and the devil. Every worldly process was a byproduct of this eternal conflict. Speaking of eternal conflicts, the Uyghurs constantly fought two groups, Tibet and the Yenisei Kyrgyz, another Turkic people who lived north of the empire. In the early 9th century, the Uyghurs pushed Tibet south, taking control of parts of Xinjiang and the Hashi Corridor, the trade route connecting China to Sogdia. However, the empire fell into rapid decline in the 830s due to famine and internal power struggles. In 840, a rival of the Uyghur Khagan invited the Yenisei Kyrgyz to attack, and the Khagan was captured and the capital sacked. This marked the sudden end of the Uyghur Empire. When the empire fell, most Uyghurs fled south. At this juncture, an important split in the Uyghur population occurred. Some of the Uyghurs fled to the Terem Basin and established the Kingdom of Kocho, settling in the centuries-old oasis towns there. Others fled for the Hashi Corridor and founded the Ganjo Uyghur Kingdom. Both branches of the Uyghurs practiced both Manichaeism and Buddhism. The Ganjo Uyghurs are actually not relevant to the history of the Uyghurs living in Xinjiang today. In 1036, the Ganjo Uyghur Kingdom was destroyed by the Tangut people, and they never again ruled their own sovereign state. 
The descendants of the Ganja Uyghurs are known as the Uyghurs with a Y, or the Yellow Uyghurs, and are a minority group in today's China. Only 15,000 remain, and they are Tibetan Buddhists, not Muslims. They speak two languages, Eastern Uyghur and Western Uyghur. Of these, Western Uyghur is part of the Siberian branch of the Turkic family and descends from Old Uyghur. Now, let's return to the main lineage of the Uyghurs, those who founded Kocho. Now living in the Terim Basin, the Kocho Uyghurs mixed with the various peoples already living there, such as the Sogdians and the Indo-European Tocharians. This means that the old Uyghurs are just one of many ancestors of today's Uyghurs. This intermixing is also why the Uyghurs of Xinjiang look more phenotypically Caucasian than the Uyghurs with the Y, who look much more traditionally East Asian. Kocho was often in conflict with the Karakhanids, who were Sunni Muslim Turks in Central Asia. While this foreshadowed things to come, Kocho retained its Buddhist identity, well reflected in the murals of the Bezeklik Caves. In the 13th century, Kocho became a vassal of the Mongol Empire. A century later, Kocho was annexed by the Chagatai Khanate, which began as a division of the Mongol Empire, but gradually turned into an Islamic Turkic kingdom. The 14th and 15th centuries were important for the history of the Uyghurs. Firstly, as I just stated, the Terim Basin turned Sunni Muslim. Secondly, the old Uyghur language fell out of use. Instead, the Chagatai language, a Turkic language with Persian and Arabic influence, became dominant. Chagatai would remain the lingua franca of Central Asia up until the 19th or even the early 20th century, though it is now extinct. Chagatai was part of the Karlik branch of the Turkic languages, not Siberian. Modern Uyghur descends from Chagatai, which means that modern Uyghur and old Uyghur are practically unrelated languages. Thirdly, the name Uyghur itself also fell out of use. After the 15th century, the descendants of Kocho were vaguely described as Turks or Turkey by contemporary sources. This makes their whereabouts following Chagatai hegemony difficult to trace, but not impossible. We'll discuss what happened to the Uyghurs from the 15th century onwards in the next video. Thanks for watching.